I am indecently excited to welcome today's enormous panel. Uh, please join me in welcoming writer and director Ryan Johnson, <laughs> producer Ram Bergman, and from the cast of Glass Onion, we have for you Daniel Craig, Kate Hudson, Edward Norton, Janelle Monet, Leslie Odom Jr., Catherine Han, Jessica Hennick, Madeline Klein, and Dave Batista. We'll be here all day. <laughs> <laughs> that is unfortunately all we've got time for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, can I start? I mean, start first of all by congratulating you all in the film. R Ryan, there's this beautiful sequence uh, towards the start where we see Benoit Blanc playing Among Us uh, in the bath <laughs> during the pandemic. Now, I want to ask you two things about this. Firstly, there's there's, there's two beautiful cameos in that sequence. Uh, of, of, folk who are no longer with us, and they've obviously both got a, a, a very special connection to the whodunit genre at large. Um, so I'd love to hear about the piecing together of that sequence, but also why it is you think that over the last few years, you know, a, a game like Among Us can become, you know, whodunits in all sorts of mediums have become so big. Yeah. What it, do you think it is about the genre that's speaking to us now? I mean, beyond the fact that everyone loved Knives Out. <laughs> well, it was, uh, and hello everybody, thanks for coming. Uh, it, it was, um, so it's, it, so, and we've talked about it a bit, so I guess it's not a spoiler, but it was Stephen Sondheim and Angela Lansbury were you. kind and generous enough, please. They were they were so kind and so generous and so and because uh, when we thought my God do you think they would either of them would ever do it we didn't think they would and both of them um, uh, were so cool and Angela was so fun I went to her house with my laptop oh. to film the oh <laughs> to God. film her doing her little bit and oh. she's like I don't know what any of this means so just to <laughs> tell me if I'm saying it right and I'm like oh. you're dizzy uh, and for both of them um, besides just the honor of having them in the movie for me personally just being able to have 10 minutes with each of them to tell them what their work has meant to me was was really really special mm -hmm. yeah. and oh uh, it, whodunits I mean for me, as a, as a murder mystery um, junkie, I'm, I'm just so thrilled that there's kind of this new crop. I feel like we kind of like caught a nice wave of people rediscovering the joys of the genre. I mean, what's not to love? You get a great mystery, you get an ensemble cast with like really interesting characters all trying to kill each other. I mean, that's that's the heart of drama, I guess. You know? And Sondheim was a huge fan of whodunits and puzzles. So Sondheim has, if for anyone who knows the mystery genre, Sondheim has deep roots in it, yeah. And he was a he was a puzzle fiend, but he also uh, co-wrote with Anthony Perkins one of my favorite movies, The Last of Sheila, which we take a page from in this movie. Um, so for a lot of reasons, it, it meant a lot to have him up there represented on the screen. Ram, you've been collaborating with Ryan ever since the, the Brick days. I've done Star Wars, Looper, uh, Brothers Bloom. What was the biggest challenge, do you think, in, in bringing the, or the original film, Knives Out, uh, to the screen? And how did it differ this time around? Was there anything that was easier or harder? The, the harder part was COVID. My job was really, my hardest job was to make sure that none of those people <laughs> get COVID. <laughs> they do. We behaved. Yeah. We if they do, we, we, we would be fucked, right? <laughs> that, so that was, Literally my biggest We're, challenge. We had to sneak out windows, but we did. We, we did. <laughs> <great>. <laughs> <laughs> Do 
Daniel, I want to ask you about these climactic monologues that you have in this film. There's, there's two of them, which is... Which is uh, One way to describe them. <laughs> you can reenact them, please. Yeah. Climactic moments. Yes. <laughs> I mean, the, there's, for, for the audience, there's so much fun to listen to, but they strike me as they, they must be a nightmare to work out how to play because you've got to impart all of this information in this really kind of dense but entertaining way. So tell me about how you play those scenes and how you approach those those kind of big speeches where Benoit lays out how things are to the to the rest of the group. Um, uh, thank you um, for, um, for having us to hit it in. Just a, what a wonderful turnout. It's lo lovely to see. It's the first press conference I've done for... Mm. I mean, it's crazy. It's like it's like a different reality. But yeah. it's so nice <laughs> to see you all. Um, humans. Uh, uh, humans. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> the, how do I do it? I just... I get them into my system as much as possible so that they are, there's no, the line learning is kind of something I've done way before. I've got it there um, and I try and make them as, and then forget it and just try and loosen it, as keep it, loosen it up and just do, try and do that acting thing, which is the, think of it. On, oh, oh, Jesus oh, Christ. Oh, goodness. <laughs> I knew that's why I like pressed on. <laughs> <laughs> I knew there was a room. Is, okay? is this a part of the show? Right? <laughs> Since the third movie has Should begun. Be <laughs> <That's a good laughs> You're in there, right? Uh, it yeah, started anyway. at a junket. <laughs> yeah, I just do that, you know, try and do that acting thing where you think of you're, you're, it's in, you're being in the moment and you think it is. I mean, the great thing is I have Ryan's amazing words, so that's really... A, a good basis for anything. Mm -hmm. Is the rhythm of obvious in the screenplay, or do you have to kind of find that when you're you're playing the scene? Um, there's a lot of rhythm in the screenplay. There's a lot of what Ryan's thinking, and then I try and put what I'm thinking in it, and somewhere between the two, we find a, a balance. I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kate and, and Dave, I want to ask you a, a joint question here because I, you know this is a genre for the, for a while, um, in, until very recently, I think it was felt as being kind of dated. But you're both playing characters that are intensely recognizable as 2020s figures. Um, <laughs> and I was wondering what it is you, you see like in the whodunit that it's able to kind of tap into um, how the world is today and what it's able to say about the world. Dave? <laughs> I couldn't really hear, hear the part of that question. And where are you? I kind of missed that first where part of the you? question. He's at the end of the table. Oh, there you are. I thought you were out here somewhere. <laughs> Like, where's the microphone? This is like uh, breakfast at Putin's or something. Me? Did you say I, me? I missed the last oh, part of that question. Sorry. Yeah, so, so the, the question is, I, the, the whodunit was quite a kind of a dated <laughs> genre for a while until, until so, Knives Out sort of brought Kate it Kate and I are both plain assholes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but very modern assholes, right? I mean, these are, these are figures that we recognize, are very recognize from, from modern culture. Yeah. yeah. Um, right. So what is it you think about this, this kind of style of story, this kind of thriller, that like it, it's able to kind of connect with how the world is right now and it can take figures like yours and kind of put them into this this kind of very traditionally oh, man, pleasing structure. I, yeah, I, I didn't overthink it that much. <laughs> I just thought it was just so much fun and, and yeah. so relatable. Hmm. And I love my character because I I love playing characters who are unlike myself. I mean, that's why I love acting. Yeah. And, and Duke was just such a douchebag. I, <laughs> loved, <laughs> I loved him immediately. <laughs> I, I feel like the, the murder mystery has always been something that people love. Uh, and Ryan just brought new life to it. And, and the ability to cast such incredible actors in one film and to have us all actually acting together. It's not like we're, you know, we don't see each other or we like see each other at the premiere card, but going, oh my God, we're in a movie together. We actually got to experience such, you know, great writing, Great actors, and then at the helm of it, you know, a new a new voice to the murder mystery. Um, as for the, the 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 other part of the question, I can't. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out that relationship to uh, it. But you know, yeah, I, I'm with I'm with Dave on that. I sort of I, I didn't I didn't think about it like the the fit, the the recognizability of it. I just sort of showed up for Birdie, mm -hmm. yeah. I think any time when you watch a film and you can walk away from it and have a conversation, it's a good film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Edward, you must have had a bit, an element of recognizability in, in your portrayal of Miles. I mean, we, this, this figure of the billionaire savior is sort of much more prominent even now than it must be when you, you wrote the script, Ryan. Um, 
What do you think it is about the, I mean, what's the appeal to the world of, of, of this character type that we, you know, we, we see in, in, in the news today? And um, The appeal of roasting the tech Illuminati? Yeah, and, and that's right. And, and exactly, what was the appeal of, of, of puncturing the, that kind of... What's thing? not to love about <laughs> roasting the tech Illuminati? Um, yeah, look, I, I think that um, it, it's not that, it's not that uh, revisiting... The, the, the classic murder mystery form isn't fun also, but I do think that what, I do think that what's delicious about what Ryan's done with this is that, is that when, when you can see the times you're living in and you can see the foibles, not just of the, 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 the puffed up characters that we see in the world around us, but even ourselves, you know that that's it doubles the laugh um it doubles the it doubles the pleasure i think and um and i think uh that's why it was so wonderful that ryan found some new targets you know um and and it just people have <clears throat> i it it's it's also fun we ryan and i had a lot of fun because there's there's such abundant feedstock for this character, <laughs> men, women. Um, there's there's about seven documentaries out right now that just uh, everything Ryan had put in and more was available to put into the blender that um, produced the smoothie of miles. And um, and I think there there you know it was it was when when um, it, it's almost like you're almost curating from from the you, you can cherry pick one quality from this this person that we've all seen and what you know it's it, it's fun to figure out how to send them all up not even just one of them mm -hmm. you know janelle i'm trying to work out how to ask this without spoilers um <laughs> it's fair to say we see two very different sides to to andy in in this film uh, what were the the most enjoyable parts of playing both of those uh those <laughs> facets of horror. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, hello, I'm so happy to just be here. I mean, look, look at this cast. Chanel Monet! Ryan Johnson, like um, an iconic director and, and even better human. And I think it was just working with Ryan, getting into the nuances of like, ooh, what if, what if, what if we leave some Easter eggs behind? Like we hope that people will watch this film twice so when they see it a second time they can look back and be like oh, it was <laughs> already there we left clues here left clues there and that was the exciting part you know collaborating with him being able to uh, and he's a true collaborator and that's what you want you know you want to go in and 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 obviously i love the script i was blown away by the twist um but when it came to like character development, I had so much fun just like working with Ryan on just those little details that, that hopefully you guys will find when you watch it five, six, seven, <laughs> eight, nine times. <laughs> Leslie, Leslie, tell me about Lionel, who's a few steps further back from the spotlight than the rest of the disruptors. I mean, there's not um, maybe such an obvious real world touchstone for the kind of person that he is. How did you work out who he was? Was there anyone or any kind of, uh, anything out there in the world that you were able to particularly draw on? Mm. Oh, sure. Um, this one. There it is. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I, I started uh, by looking for, by, by searching for a, a real world touchstone that I might base Lionel off of. I was obviously looking specifically for um, who are the black rock star scientists. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I found one in the States. There's a, he, was a, he was a scientist for NASA and he accidentally invented the super soaker. He was, uh, <laughs> he was doing, he was in a, in a test for NASA. He, he invented this thing where, you know, the, it was pressurized water and he was like, oh, this would make a really cool <laughs> water gun for kids. And so, and I had no idea a black man invented the super soaker. So I, I envisioned, I envisioned him 
actually as like Lionel's grandfather. <laughs> so that's what that's what is sort of the tension at the top of this movie for Lionel. You know, why why do you you know, we all have connections to this billionaire who pulls our strings and we're all there for different reasons, you know, and what, you know, we allow this guy to get us out of line of, with our integrity. And uh, for Lionel anyway, I just imagine that he, he comes from this lineage of rock star scientists and he hasn't quite, he hasn't invented his super soaker yet. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, it's, he's, he's sticking around. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine, your character is understandably very paranoid about being caught swanning off to Greece in the middle of the pandemic. <laughs> um, as an actor, what was it like swanning off to Greece in the middle of the pandemic? <laughs> it was so tough. <laughs> No, first, I, I also just have to say I'm really having a Notting Hill or Notting Hill dream right now. I feel like I'm in a junket in London for the first time, and I can't believe it. So just thank you. This is a real dream come true. Not that I'm Julia Roberts. I'm just saying. I'm going to pretend to be. Um, oh, where's my Hugh Grant? <laughs> but I... <laughs> thank you! Oh! Um, but I, I just... Um, going to... <laughs> Horse and hound, horse and hound in the front. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell my husband after. Um, uh, but yeah, no, going to Greece in the middle of a pandemic, I got to bring my family, which was amazing. Um, because of the COVID, and uh, as Ram was talking before, we, he ran a very tight ship, which was great. So we really had to become this, the really, the bubble of this of this cast and this crew became, <clears throat> because of the circumstances, we really were able to create in this beautiful environment um, the rules of the game, of the movie outside the movie, became such that we really did create such a circus. Like it <laughs> did feel like we were this traveling circus together, um, which felt which added, I think, to the texture of the movie. Like, you can feel it kind of like the fizzle and the, the fizz. Um, that kind of closeness that we were able to create under those circumstances um, really added, I think, to the, the feeling that we all were able to, to have, um, that closeness. So um, it was, a, that place is a dream. I'd never been before. Um, still dreaming about those Greek salads. And um, yeah, so it was heaven, no complaints. It was the most beautiful place ever. Yeah, Not, uh, yeah w uh, that I've seen. Qualifiers, <laughs> 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 <Well, the fire. laughs> so far. <laughs> uh. Jessica, I want to ask you about finding your character's position in the social hierarchy because she's in such an un unusual, I mean, nobody else in, in the group is, is, is at all kind of occupying the same space as her. So how did you <clears throat> like triangulate where she was at in, in, in terms of the, uh, the rest of the group and how she would kind of feel in that, in that scenario? Um, I mean, I think Peg is largely ignored by the rest of the group. <laughs> uh, but for me, the key was really figuring out the relationship with Birdie. Um, there is obviously the superficial relationship of she is her assistant, but I think that Kate and I really wanted to make it feel like it was this almost toxic love mm. affair that's been going on for 10 years in that, you know, Peg has probably turned up to work several times and said, I quit, I'm done. And then she probably comes back to work the next day and they don't mention it at all. <laughs> and that's just a vicious cycle that keeps yes. happening. <laughs> uh, but I think, yeah, I think that was really my touchstone for creating the character was that relationship. And Madeline, a similar question to you. You know, um, whiskey's there as a plus one, right? I mean, so she's she's not got the same status as the uh, as the rest of the guests. So how did you work out about how she was going to uh, to, to, to interact with the um, with with her more famous or Im important uh, cool holly makers? I, um, I Ryan and I talked about this in our first meeting, and it was whisk. I mean. Obviously, Whiskey and Duke, she's t Duke's plus one. Um, and I think she is aware of the fact that the rest of the group is quite annoyed and perturbed by her presence. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> or just see her as, you know, you know, Gen Z, millennial, oh, TikToker, oh, God, <laughs> she's posting on, on Instagram again. Um, and 
And so I think we just decided it would be really fun to just play around like whiskey likes to push buttons. <laughs> so how can we just like play with that? And I, I think uh, really leaned into uh, that kind of like playfulness um, and uh, I don't know, just like cheeky. <laughs> yeah. I want to open this to questions from the room. If you'd like to ask something, please raise your hand. Uh, good, loads of questions. I can also say, I mean, the, the panel here have got this uh, obscene number of creative projects between them. So if we could keep questions focused to, to this film in particular, that would be great. Thank you. Can we start there? Uh, there's a roving mic uh, somewhere. Uh, yes, there it is. So sorry, the, 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 the most far person for me in the room. No. And then we'll, we'll come over to this side next. We'll go, go, go there, yeah. Uh, just now. Hi, it's Sarah from uh, Movies on Weekends. This is a question for Edward. Um, Miles has a really good style journey from Magnolia to Steve Jobs. What was your favorite? He really speaks to his character. What was your favorite costume good catch, to play? By the way, <laughs> <laughs> what was your favorite costume and why? Uh, my favorite costume might have been Duke's bikini, <laughs> <laughs> with the whole. Story. Just, once you see it, you can't unsee it. The best. I'm never, ever going to live that down. Um, no. Nor should you. <laughs> no, I was in trouble. <laughs> That's true. I think, um, <clears throat> uh, well, I, I th it's an opportunity to, to say what we all feel, which is that Jenny Egan, our costume designer, might have been the, M yeah. the MVP. Uh. Um, I, I, I don't think anybody got more laughs in the film than Jenny, actually. No, right but, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, 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 I think we worked from the presumption that Miles has never had an original idea in his life, so everything, <laughs> everything had to be a reference to something. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so next question from the excellent jacket in the third row there. Um, microphone's just coming. Mm -hmm. Look at this teamwork. Yeah. Yeah. Music stops. Hello, uh, I'm Carrie from Gadio. You can probably guess the target demographic. Um, <laughs> I wanted to firstly ask uh, Ryan and then open it up to the cast. Why do you think murder mysteries and crime fiction are such a tonic for people, kind of going on from what Kate said? And I'd love to open it up for the cast on what it is like to contribute to this genre. Mm. Mm. Um, well, I mean, we talked about all the fun elements of it. I mean, one other thing, like talking about the current element of it in terms of these characters and setting it in, in modern times. To me, that's as a massive Agatha Christie fan, if Agatha Christie were writing right now, she'd be writing about, she'd have tech billionaires and she'd have these characters. She wasn't writing period pieces, she was writing exactly to her time. And all of the things that we think of as murder mystery tropes were people in society who, who everybody had, kind of like an uncle who had been in the war, who was kind of, you know, it, it, the t this, things that we think of as, the, as like the back of clue cards were people that she was actually, that everyone would have been familiar with. So anyway, to me, it's just the notion of making it current is kind of getting back to, um, back to the source a bit, I guess. Mm. Anyone from the cast want to <laughs> chime in? I mean, I, it's interesting because this this genre had always been, when I was, was growing up, like I would always feel like kind of tired in the middle of watching a, a, a murder mystery. Like there was this feeling of like, uh, but I, I, but so when I fought, when I saw the the original Knives Out, I remember being like, oh, there was something so. <laughs> <laughs> Try to write that down. <laughs> but there was there was something so refreshing about it, and and invigorating, and and um, <clears throat> thrilling, and fresh, and um, so specific with the characters. And again, we talked about Jenny and just the the editing, and the music by Nathan, uh, just uh, who's incredible, who did the score for this as well. Yeah, yeah. Let's start that. Um, but uh, so I, I was I, I was thrilled by Ryan um, screenwriting. It just and even in reading this, the um, the you just cannot believe that it's going to be pulled off. Yeah. That thrill is is 
I, it's like that wonder that you have as a kid going to the theater of like, how is he gonna pull it off? How is he gonna pull it off? You just, it's so exciting when things um, resolve that you forgot, that you've forgotten that that's even something to be resolved. <laughs> that's like so exciting, um, that, that kind of feeling. So that's something about a murder mystery that I, that feeling, that's then, and it's also fun, it's not heavy, heavy. Um, that's a real thrill. <laughs> okay, uh, question there. Um, and then we'll come over to, uh, so yeah, right, right at the very, very far end there. I guess. Mm -hmm. Who'll get the mic first? You go first and then we'll come here. Hi, Soma Ghosh, long form film essayist for a number of British and international publications. Um, like a musical, there's an almost obscenely gleeful choreography of teasing surfaces in this film. So I've got two little questions to just probe under those surfaces. Number one, is Philip Benoit's lover? <laughs> and is Benoit, in fact, queer? Or are y'all just playing? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh. Yes, he obviously is, yeah. But, of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, just and, look at I'd, the casting. And I'd, I'd lo and I'd love to hear Daniel just uh, unpeel that, that, that onion. I, there's nothing else little. to add. I think that's it. I mean, it's like... <laughs> <laughs> and there's nobody in the world I can imagine it bringing me more joy for Benoit Blanc to, to yeah. be with. Who would, and, who, and to not, no spoilers, who wouldn't want to live with that person? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Everybody, everybody. Yeah. Um, I mean, whatever, whatever your gender or orientation, I think, right? It's kind right. of, it's Hugh Grant and, and Julianne Moore forever. So th th those are the two. Um, second question. Question, why do we like to see rich people murder each other in the holiday season? <laughs> <laughs> and do such stories on screen affect any kind of real disruption? <clears throat> well, I mean, the, the first one, it's kind of self-evident. I can think of nothing more fun than what you just described. Um, <laughs> Second one, I don't know. I mean, that's that's a bigger question. That's a question that would require an essayist to probably I'd, I'd say one, yeah. one can only hope. <laughs> <laughs> it in, uh, no, no, no. But, no. <laughs> <laughs> Edward, no. <laughs> We're good. Moving but, on. But I think we, we, we come at these movies primarily as entertainments, and we try and weave other yeah. things into them. But first and foremost, our objective is... Um, our objective is to give the audience a damn good time yes. the audience, in, yeah, in, when it. they're watching it. So that's that's always goal number one. And then we we do we have other stuff into them. But if we've accomplished that number one, that's and we're happy. That's right. Mm. Let's go here. Hi, uh, it's Natalie Jameson from BBC Five Live. Uh, a question for Ryan, but also opened up to the cast as well. Without any spoilers, you name check and attach some celebrities to brands uh, in this. Were they all in on the joke, and did any of the cast suggest any names? <laughs> uh, no, I think they were all in the script. And they were? Yeah, yeah. And they, were, <laughs> they were, you know, without any spoilers, like all that, it was, it was very generous of everybody to, to lend themselves to it and, and to kind of have fun with it. I they think. don't know. Yeah, yeah. Don't please don't tell them. them. Please so don't tell them. If we could keep this between <laughs> us, <laughs> we could just like, shh. Know about Wa yes. waivers. So as long as we can get away with it, we'll be keep pushing this. <laughs> uh, let's go over to this side. Uh, yeah. So on, on on the front row there, and then we'll come to you. Uh, Van Connor, BBC. Um, first of all, congratulations to all of you. An amazing movie. Great <coughs> sequel. Um, question. This is more for uh, Daniel, Ryan and Ram. Uh, having started as uh, a theatrically exclusive franchise three years ago, how has the experience of moving to a streaming platform and having the added security of a further third instalment affected the, the development of this incredible series? Well, the, the script was written before before we kind of worked out the deal with Netflix and everything. So creatively, it doesn't affect at all. We're just trying to make the best movie every time. I'm personally, I'm thrilled um, that, uh, that Netflix has, has made this deal for the theatrical thing that we're doing with it at the, at, at, in November. And for me, I just, I love people watching it at home. I really, though, want, if people want to see it in the theater, I want them to have the opportunity to and see it with a crowd. And I'm really grateful Netflix has, Stepped up and uh, and and we're we're doing a version of that. Over here, 
Uh, Mirko from Completely News. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question for Mr. Craig. Um, sorry for my English, I'm Italian, so, uh, <laughs> so sorry for Beautiful. this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we saw a last cameo from uh, for Angela Lansbury in this movie. How much did she inspire you for this character? Uh, I mean, I, I, she, Angela Lansbury has been in my all in my life, all my life. Um, I mean, I, I, my favorite film is Bed Knobs and Broomsticks. So I mean, I, so, yeah. so so I kind of like, you know. But what? All I, how much did she inspire this? That I, I I don't know. But what I'll say is, I just sort of you know the fact that she's in our movie is we we're so blessed, and also what an incredible life she had, and mm -hmm. just an incredible you know what she did. Thank you so much. Bed knobs and broomsticks. If you haven't seen it, you've got to see it. Isn't it? Oh, movie, that was my it? favorite. I actually, I, I, I wanted that bed. I know. Where they rubbed it. I think we have time for a couple more, uh, if you want to return. So let's, let's go here, yep, and uh, then we'll go to you. In fact, if you go first, because we've got Mike here. Hi, my question is for Ryan. So the Houdin genre uh, has well-established tropes and structural pleasures that audiences, you know, you go into Houdin and you know what you're going to get and, you know, you go in expecting something. But uh, Glass Onion is also a film that's hyper, you know, contemporary and rooted in, you know, the Twitter discourse of the week. So when writing a film like Glass Onion, how do you navigate that delicate fine line between preserving the structural pleasures of the Houdinit and also infusing contemporary discourse? Mm. That's a very good question. Well, um, I, I, I mentioned before, but I'll come back to it I, again because this whole thing stems from my love of Agatha Christie, and I feel strongly that what you described is what she was doing in in her time, and she was innovating with every new book that she wrote. She was finding new ways to approach the genre. She was putting twists on it that, if you did them today, people would say, "Man, that's it's very subversive. That's very you're subverting the genre." And she would do that every single time, and so. Um, I'm just trying to trying to kind of claw my way up to up to doing something like that, um, and I think the other trick to these movies is uh, to approach them to make sure that there's a narrative engine that is not a puzzle but is a ride. Um, they're they're roller coaster rides, not crossword puzzles. And hopefully, our, our aim is to give the audience such a good time and actually, like any movie does, bring them along on a journey that's satisfying at the end in ways beyond just, oh, aha, that person did it. Um, and if we can do that and then also layer in the pleasures of a murder mystery and those traditional things that I love too, um, that's kind of the, the secret sauce we aim for with these. And here. Hello, hi, uh, I'm Ayush Sharma from uh, MEA Worldwide India. And thank you so much for making my first ever LFF so memorable with this movie. Oh, thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you. Oh, okay. yeah. So my question is for Kate. Uh, so what were the challenges you faced while playing a role like uh, Birdie? And uh, I heard that you saw the movie with an audience yeah. to get a reaction of like how do I they feel so about nervous. it. So what was your uh, outcome and what did you feel about it? And the other cast can also chip in. You know how did they feel about the movie if they if they also uh, saw it with an audience or not? It's challenging because Bert, Bertie's so tone deaf, you know. So when you're, <laughs> when you're saying some, some of the things she says are, you know, if 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 I thought too hard about them are quite scary. Um, but Ryan wrote such a great character in Bertie. She's so deeply funny and <laughs> oblivious to herself, um, and layered and kind of sad and codependent. And you know, there's just there was so much. There was so much fun to be had with her, so it was just a dream. And he's, as everyone's saying, is just an absolute joy. So you feel really safe saying types of things Bertie says. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and as for the ex the, the 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 TIFF, exp I've never seen a, a film at a premiere first, you know. And of course, I'll leave it to Ryan to be like, nope, you're gonna see it with 1,500 people uh, sweating and <laughs> with a headache before. But honestly, I, it, was, it was such a, 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 I mean, it was an explosion of laughter and, you know, fun noise. The collective experience for this movie was just dreamy. And, and I've never had that before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, so to, to feel that in a room gave me a couple things. One, how great this 
movie experiences, Glass Onion, but also how necessary it is to have that collective experience, that we need it, that, that you could feel the energy of people wanting to laugh together and, and, get, and go on that ride together, um, which is why it's so great it's gonna be in theaters for, for that week. Um, yeah, and that was, that's how I felt about that. I mean, we, we, we thought it was funny. That doesn't <laughs> necessarily mean that everybody else thinks it's funny. So, <laughs> so, so have that experience and realize that they That's did. That's right. Yeah. I think we have time for one more. Uh, yeah, so let's go. You, you're straight away on, on the corner there. Um, my phone is there. Yeah, perfect. No pressure with the last question, of course. <laughs> this is going to be the rubbish yeah, one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, I'm, I'm Emily from Zavi. My question is for Madeline. Um, I love whiskey. I think she's so funny. And I think oh, it's brilliant you. how there's more than meets the eye with her character mm. when we get those reveals later on. Mm. So I'm wondering, was that what drew you to the role? For sure. Um, I just felt like there was so much exploration to do. Um, and especially into, like, kind of to piggyback off of what I was saying earlier, to uh, maybe, like, do a little bit of a deep dive into some of the other characters and see what buttons whiskey would specifically push mm. with Claire. <laughs> and it's not going to be the same one as Birdie <laughs> um, or Lionel. And, uh, and also, I, I think, you know, she is wearing a mask um, in the film. And she, I, she, I think she's also deeply insecure, but she is, um, but she's also, she's playing a role. Um, and so that was that was a really fun little um, concoction of um, I don't know uh, things to explore. That is all we've got time for. In fact, it's so much all we've got time for that I don't have time to thank the entire panel by name. But thank you all very much for yeah. coming today. Thank you. All thank for you.